few people in prayer today. We have some people out that aren't feeling very good, kind of down under. And so I know Bob and BJ have requested prayer. And um, I believe also um, Dawn or Lindsay, they've been kind of under it. What? Oh, yeah, Dawn had her teeth removed, and she's been in a lot of pain. So um, let's just keep them in prayer. We're going to also have some time today where we'll pray for each other, because I can use that too. I got up this morning going, okay, Jesus, we're going to do this, but I'm going to need some prayer today. Um, so, And then also I just wanted to um, thank you. Pastor and I will be leaving for Aruba on the 24th of... Um, this month, and it's kind of cool because it's a, it was a Jesus surprise. I had already decided because we were, you know, Apostle Jamie had mentioned it two years ago. And so I was like, I want to go. I really want to go, Jesus. I, I really want to go, Jesus, you know, <laughs> serious about this. And, um, you know, it, it just didn't work for us with, with our roof, obviously, our I was watching the guys yesterday sweep the shingles off my roof. Like, just sweep them. Like, just sweep them off with a broom. I'm like, are those, like, just, you guys are just kind of, like, sweeping off the loose shingles. And they're like, yeah. Seth was up there sweeping. He goes, Mom, they just fall off when you walk on them. I'm like, we really needed a roof really bad. And uh, I didn't realize how bad until my brother, like, chewed me out on the phone in a sense in a good way. He's like, your roof is so dangerous. You could have fires. I'm talking water coming down your walls. And he was like, okay, so we need a roof. And God is so good. And, you know, they're up there putting the roof on and I'm looking at it. And, and honestly, a few weeks ago, that was my Aruba trip. And, you know, we were trying. I just, just couldn't wrap my head around spending money on anything but that. We got a kitchen. I, I needed a sink since June. So... I'm um, so grateful for everybody that helped me get my kitchen. I mean, Bob's like amazing. I'm telling on him, don't pull on him too hard, but he's amazing when it comes to cupboards. <laughs> and so really appreciate all that you helped us with and you made my life happy. Um, you and my husband um, and the guys that put it together, some of the guys, they're not here, but Dwayne Speaks and another um, Steve and Steve Ely, they helped us and Literally, I was in my kitchen this last week cooking with joy. I mean, literally, I had this joy to cook, and I love my kitchen, and I've kept, I have done the dishes all but once since that kitchen's been done, and I haven't had a problem with it because they go in the dishwasher, and it's wonderful. And Tim's like, I don't even know how to work the dishwasher, and I don't want to learn. I'm like, no, you are going to learn how to work that dishwasher. <laughs> so... I said all that to say, you know, I kind of settled that we weren't going to Aruba. And then we get this phone call from Bishop Jamie. And he's like, there's a room available for you for 200 bucks for the week, right on the beach, in the nicest hotel, the nicest part of the Marriott. And it's yours if you want it. And, um, and I'm going to give my offering to you on Friday to help you with food. I guess food there's really high. Um, of course, when you think about Mackinac Island, anybody ever go to Mackinac? You know, an average burger up there, it's, it's expensive to eat on the island, so I understand. So when that all came about, we got our passports, we kind of drove to Detroit and got them quickly, and I'm sitting there holding my passport going, Jesus, you really blow me away with how good you are to me. And just, just who he is, how kind. And um, I so appreciate his friendship and his heart. Don't you just appreciate the heart of Jesus towards you? I so appreciate his heart towards me because he does things he doesn't have to do. He doesn't. He doesn't have to do that. But he wants to. When you start seeing God as he really wants to love you the way that you need to be loved. I love it. I think it was Pastor Darren was saying, God is all the gifts, all the languages, love languages. He's gifts. He gave us the greatest gift. He's touch. He loves to wrap his arms around us. 
He's everything. We, he's words. He gives us lots of words. You know, I was blessed by the, some of the words that Apostle Jamie was giving. I was blessed when he gave Stephan the word on Friday. I'm, I was soaking that up and loving that. And he does that. Jesus just gives us words to tell you who you are, always to bring out your potential, always to bring out your value, always. The times that I've expected him to rebuke me, you know, especially back in the day when it was all about works with me and I had to pray so many times, uh, you know, a week and so many hours a week. And when I would fail to do that, I would feel like a lousy Christian. I was a loser in that week, you know. And I remember going through a season, adjusting, moving here and just feeling not feeling so good about things. And uh, actually, it was kind of interesting. I got a prophetic word that literally devastated my heart. Uh, and I never forgot it. You know, the prophetic words that devastate your heart, you kind of know that that's probably not the Spirit of God. Yeah. And basically, the, spirit, the, the word was, you're just a Martha. Stop being a Martha. And I was like, what? You know, because I wanted to be a Mary. I was trying so hard to be a Mary. And the more I've learned about Jesus, and he went to that prophetic word, he said, could you just please pull that out of the computer files and rip it up and burn it? Because it was not my heart. And then other times when I felt like I deserved the worst, he always gave me the best. I was in shock. I'm like, are we talking about the same? Are you sure you mean me, God? Jesus will always speak to your potential. So today, I want to just share with you, I woke up during the night a few times, but I woke up during the night and I kept hearing the scripture go over and over on the, the inside of me that basically he was anointed, God anointed Jesus of Nazareth who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed of the devil. And it was like he was shouting to me during the night. He went about doing good. He went about doing good. And healing all. Healing all. I mean, if you look at who Jesus is, which is, I, I really feel that's where we're at and where we need to stay. It's all about Jesus. Yeah. It's just all about Jesus. Right. Our life should be centered around Jesus. It should be all about him. He was the perfect human. He showed us humanity and what it should look like because all of us are learning to be human. Yeah. We learn to be human. If we're from a child, an infant treated inhumane, we grow up dysfunctional as a human being. Yeah. Sure. If we are abused and we are used and we are thrown aside and we are ignored or we are wounded by those that should be protecting us, we end up distorted as a human being thinking that that's normal. Right, yeah. Yeah. We grow up, whatever kind of chaos we grow up in is a lot of times the house, the home we produce. And God is always after our heart and he's always after giving us a new experience to show us the reality of really who we can be and who we are. Yeah. So he's always going after us. He'll never stop going after us. Because he wants us to be fully human. Jesus was so human. I think for years I always put him up so high in the sense of, well, he never had a bad day. He never had a moment where he was sad or maybe discouraged. I kind of think sitting over the city and looking at Jerusalem and weeping would be a moment of Jerusalem. I just wanted to gather you. Yeah. Yeah. You're breaking my heart right now. Yeah. Or when he wept, first of all, with Lazarus, when he died, he didn't stop and go, I'm the man of the hour, here I come. Dun, 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 dun. He came in the midst of them and he wept with them. And then he said, okay, let's fix this. There's times when we go through things that we can't help but weep. And I remember in the past thinking weeping is not a, a faith. It's just that I'm not having faith right now. And God's like, just cry, Cindy, and let me hold you. And then we'll deal with it. 
but allow your humanity to come forth. Allow those moments of sadness or even anger or frustration or whatever it is. Obviously, you don't want to destroy people in that, but there's times that we just go, I don't like this. Yep. Humanity's okay because Jesus showed us what the perfect human looked like. And he's always after our heart to see that example so that we can be human. Right. We can be human. Yeah. Yeah. Healthy humans walking on this planet representing his heart. So today, I woke up this morning, what I want to title my sermon, I got a title, JJ, you're so proud of me. <laughs> it's called, This is My Jesus. My husband said today, he goes, how come you can't say this is our Jesus? I'm like, I don't know. It just sounds better saying this is my Jesus. Because <laughs> he is my Jesus. He's individual to all of us. Yeah, that's true. Obviously, he's corporate within us. But we make him personally ours. This is my Jesus. And the scripture that I want to go to is Acts chapter 10. And I like this. It says, Acts 10.34. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, In truth, I perceive that God shows no partiality. Wow, that's really nice. Because if we grow up in a family where there's partiality, we have a tendency to think that's the way it is with God. Well, God loves you more because, you know, you're a pastor or you're, you give more or you work more, or you're just prettier, or God just loves you more because you're kinder, or whatever. He shows no partiality. But in every nation who fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. The word which God sent to the children of Israel, preaching peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. I love that. The word Jesus, the word came. Preaching peace. He is Lord of all. That word you know, which was proclaimed throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached. In other words, the word, you guys know him. After he was baptized, he went through Galilee, started in Galilee and went out preaching the kingdom. How? God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. I like this because um, that word there, good, actually means a benefactor or a philanthropist. A philanth philanthropist. Yeah, that's that philanthropist. <laughs> Just, yeah. yeah, whatever. That word. How come some words get stuck in my tongue and they never come out right? It doesn't matter how many times I say it. Philanth. You gotta say the T at the end. Philanthropist. <laughs> okay, forget that. He was, anyways, a benefactor. You guys won't forget that, right, though? Right? Okay, maybe not. A worker of good. Jesus was always working good. And see, we like to think, well, it's just obviously, it was just um, healing the blind and obviously all the good things he did. But I like to see it even more on a a simple way. Like, okay, for instance, we went out with Chuck Crisco this last week. And I, I notice things about people. I love to watch people. In fact, Chuck said to me, he goes, you know, you're a people watcher. I'm like, yes, I am. He goes, I told him, I said, I can go to the mall and sit in one of those couches for hours and just watch people. And that is entertainment for me. <laughs> Whenever I was, you know, working at a store, the magazines that I tended to get during break was always the People magazine or Us magazine. I know they're just full of gossip and people, but I wanted to believe it was the people. Like, that's why I love Facebook. I scroll because I love people. I love their lives. I want to see their pictures. I want to know what they're doing. I want to not. And some people are like, I go on Facebook and I never look at nothing. I'm just always in the news feed, not the news feed, my, you know, scrolling because I love people. And so I'm watching Chuck. And I'm telling on you, Chuck, I hope you're watching me. Mm -hmm. But he is such a doer of good. Just being with him. Like, we would go into a restaurant, 
if anyone was coming in, and it happened a few times, he would open the door and greet them like he was the greeter. <laughs> Hi, how are you today? Come on in, kind of thing, you know? And they're like, thanks, and just kind. Our waitress, the moment she came to the table, what's your name? You know, Michelle, Michelle, I'm glad. I'm glad you're here today. Thanks for being our waitress. I mean, literally, and then every time she came to the table, he would say her name. And talk to her and be kind to her. And, and this happened every time we went anywhere. We, we took him over to Stocking, Stocking, Wood, Pierce, Pierce. Stocking Pierce Drive. And there was a lady there that was on crutches and had her foot, you know, all in a cast type thing. And you could see immediately his heart was moved. And she was probably, I don't know, maybe in her 60s. Yeah. And she's out walking through sand and climbing up to go see. And, and the first part he saw her and he was, she was walking away and you could tell, I'm like, he wants to pray for her. And he's like, oh, she's gone. Well, the next point that we went to, she was there again. He goes, yes, you're here. You know, we had already talked to her a little bit. And he's like, so he's asking questions of her and talking to her. And he's like, I knew it was coming. I was watching. He's like, can I just pray for your foot? She was I would love you to pray for my foot. We're Christians and we would love prayer. He was like, yes. So he's just praying. I prayed with him right there, you know, people walking by on the sidewalk. And I just was watching how human he was. Just how human he was. See, when you start losing fear and you start getting rid of judgments and you start seeing everybody as brother and sister, whether they know Christ or not, you literally start to become more humane. It's really hard to drop bombs on somebody that you would have to call your sister or brother. Yeah, absolutely. It's hard, but if we can isolate them and make them our enemy, then it's easier for us to disassociate with them that they're not human, right. that their children really aren't real, that what's happening to them you know, doesn't matter because they deserve it. But the more you start demonstrating Jesus and looking like Jesus, the more human you become. And so I'm watching him thinking, wow, he loves people, genuinely loves people. And just as so, I mean, we had the best conversations. We just loved on the people that served us and wherever we went. And genuinely felt loved by him. Not saying that none of the other speakers do that. But I was observing him because he was a stranger to me. You know, I know the other ones, I've observed them, and they're wonderful men of God, great character. But it was very cool to observe someone that I didn't know I only had met on Facebook and see the genuine heart, not only from Facebook and the articles he writes, but coming through in person. I told him he was my friend, whether he liked it or not. You've got a lifelong friend. <laughs> Doing good. Those are the little things. Do you think Jesus held open the door for somebody? I think he did. Do you think that he would be the one that, you know, would wipe the snout off of a face of a child that's all, ugh, and come up and just with his sleeve, whatever, clean up their little face? I mean, things that we do, the little things that we do, never underestimate anything that you do that's good for humanity, that's kind towards someone, because that's how I see my Jesus. I see him normal. I don't see him anymore on this big pedestal, pedestal, <laughs> you know, up high and all. I mean, that's great. But I see him down with the lowly. I see him bending over to help those that are broken. I see him in a, a whole new light. That's my Jesus. And the word anointed there is really interesting because here's the thing. Many times we end up going, well, I'm just not anointed. You have more anointing than me. You're more anointed to, than me to get your prayers answered. And we have, we have even taught it in the past that the anointing drains out of you. Right? You can get it and then some jerk ruins your day and they just drain all the anointing. Like, I, I don't believe that anymore. It's like draining Jesus out of you. How do you drain Jesus out of you? That's right. But we believe that. Like, you know, I prayed and I heard preachers preach it. I fasted. I was really anointed. And then I had to deal with this person, this person, this person, this person on the way to church or from Saturday. And that's why I needed to just seclude myself from all humanity and talk to no one 
because they drain the anointing out. I can give the anointing to two or three, or I can give it to the masses. So I'm going to ignore <laughs> the two or three because right. you drain my anointing, and I'm going to give it to the masses. <laughs> That's pathetic, you guys. That's bad doctrine. That's bad doctrine. Jesus has enough on the inside of you. And I'm not saying you can't, you don't sleep. You don't rest. You don't take care of yourself. But there's enough of Jesus on the inside of you for every person you come in contact with and more. Absolutely. It's called pulling on his grace and allowing his grace. And, and you, know, you may think I'm mocking. I'm mocking that in a sense because that's what I believed and that's what I did. Yeah. So I'm spanking myself this morning. <laughs> Because that mindset had to come crashing down in me. The anointing lives within all of us. Yeah. And it said here that God anointed Jesus of Nazareth. The word anointed there, and I like it, it's to handle or to furnish what is needed. Yeah. To give an oracle or a grace or a touch. To light upon, to act towards in a given moment. To entreat, to use. Or the idea of contact, to smear with oil, however it is. But I love the part to furnish what is needed. Yeah. Yeah. God anointed Jesus of Nazareth to furnish what was needed on the earth. Yeah. He has anointed every one of us to furnish us with what is needed. What is needed at that moment with who you're with in your life. You have the anointing within you, and it will teach you, and it will show you. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and it will bring things out of you you didn't even know were there. I remember when he told me to play the piano, and I didn't know how. I had no musicians. It was me and Darren. Yeah. Well, drums don't just sound good by themselves. Yes, they do. Okay, they do, but <laughs> yes, not, do. <laughs> not the whole song. And he's like, go to the piano and play. I'm like, I can't. I don't know how. Go to the piano and play. God, we need to have a discussion here because I don't know how. I mean, I had taken two years of piano lessons and hated every moment. I knew CD. I knew some of the chords. But to sing and play, ha <laughs> But once I got there and I started, he brought out of me what was needed. He blew me away. And people would come that... They blew me away, too. I, I think God sent angels. But they would come to me and say, you play the piano so well. I'd been playing one month. I love the way you play. And I'm like, I was looking at faces that just looked at me like, poor baby. I feel so <laughs> sorry for her. And then other people were like, you just really blessed me with your worship. And I was like, what are you doing? It's leaving here. But I think somewhere in the process of going out there, angels tweak it. <laughs> and make it so much better. So their ears are hearing something different than what my ears are, and I just had to trust the Father. He anointed Jesus with what was needed. He's anointed us with what's needed in life. I love what one of my friends said. He said, you know, I'm anointed to be the husband of this lady for what she needs, not what other women need. Yeah. I'm anointed to be the husband for what she needs. Yeah, right. So I ask God all the time and I thank him, show me who my wife is and show me what she needs. Yeah. Yeah. And I tell you what, when, when you get that, God starts showing you, no, 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 don't do that. That will irritate her. Do this. This will bless her. He'll show you how to love your wife or your husband. If needed. Is that what's needed? Yeah. I love that. It's just, you don't ever feel alone, alone in anything. I want to read something to you guys. Leviticus 21, 18. This is what religion looks like. We saw what Jesus looks like. We're going to say a little bit more what Jesus looks like, but I want to show you. This is what religion looks like, and this really should just boggle all of our minds that they actually could believe this. Leviticus 21, 18 says, For any man who has a defect shall not approach a blind or lame man who has a marred face or any limb too long. 
A man who has a broken foot or a broken hand or is a hunchback, how rude. (laughs) Or a dwarf, how rude. (laughs) Or a man who has a defect in his eye or eczema, that would, have been, that would have totally eliminated my husband years ago. He got healed of that. But, you know, come on. Or a scab. Really? I popped a zit and now I can't go see God. <laughs> or a eunuch. No man of the descendants of Aaron, the priest, who has a defect shall come near to offer the offerings made by fire to the Lord. He has a defect. He shall come not near to offer the bread of his God. He may not eat the bread of his God, both the most holy and the holy. Only he shall not go near the veil or approach the altar because he has a defect. Lest he profane my sanctuaries, for I, the Lord, sanctify them. And the Moses told it to Aaron. You know, Mo, I think you needed a clue. And Aaron and his sons and all the children of Israel. When you read this, and then you see who Jesus is. Jesus went to the lepers who you weren't supposed to touch. Wait, only I have seen the Father. Only me. No one else has seen the Father, not even Mo. Okay, I saw the Father. I know what Dad looks like. So I'm going to tell all of you, and I'm going to show all of you the real Father. So I'm the one who's going to go to the leper, and I'm going to touch the unclean. I'm going to allow the woman that's bleeding with the issue of blood yep. Yep. to come and touch me. I, I am going to show you the heart of God. Now, obviously, honestly, there are some places still, religions that will not let people into their temple if they're not members and giving. and They cannot even go to the temple. You have to be a member for a whole year. You can study that one out. There's maybe more than one. But I was like, what? They believe that? Yeah, no, no one is excluded, remember? There is no partiality with God. Jesus showed us true humanity. This here, I mean, God wanted it in the book. I believe that. I just don't believe it's the heart of the Father. Yeah, right, right. It's in the book. It's showing me comparison of Jesus, of Jesus to this. Right. Mm -mm. religion always excludes religion always makes someone better you're a dwarf sorry you can't come to the house Laura's like you have a scab out the door you're pregnant outside of marriage go away you are gay we don't allow gays You have committed adultery, so you need to go. You've been divorced. We don't let divorcees be ministers or licensed or in the church, really. I mean, you can come, but look out because the spears will fly. Does any of that sound normal? I'm not, I'm saying that's happened, right? Throughout history. That's not Jesus. That is not my Jesus. This is my Jesus, okay? We'll get off the negative. We'll go to the positive. Religion always excludes. Religion is actually very ugly. Religion holds signs that say turn or burn. Religion holds signs that say, you know, God hates fags. Religion holds signs that say, Um, I'm glad that these soldiers died because God hated them. That's not Jesus. And here's the thing, you guys. This is the coolest part. I see Jesus now walking in the midst of all the protesters. I see him as they're holding their signs, shouting who he is, walking up to them and wiping the sweat of the day off of them and just looking at them. I see the love of God for them too, where I wanted to spit on them because they made me so angry. My heart now is like, if 
Father, show them who you are. Show them Jesus. Please show them Jesus. Who's going to pray for them if we don't? There's enough people shaking their fists back at them. But they need the heart of the Father to pray for them. Like Jesus said, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. And he prayed over Jerusalem. He wept. Isaiah 42, guys. Verse 1. Behold my servant, who, servant whom I uphold, my elect one in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the Gentiles. I like this. It's kind of the same. My spirit. God, I'm putting my spirit on him. He will not cry out nor raise his voice nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break. A smoking flax, he will not quench. He will bring forth justice for truth. He will not fail nor be discouraged until he's established justice in the earth. And the coastlands will wait for his law. JJ, there's a few pictures you could throw in there that I've given. One of them is, you know, he will not cry out. This That's probably not one of them yet, but... Um, when he said he won't cry out or raise his voice, I see humility. Jesus was not out there tooting his own horn. This is what he looked like to the adulterer. Hey, let me get down here with you instead of standing above you. And let me pick you up. A bruised and broken reed he's not going to snap off. When you're in the worst place of your life, you can count on Jesus to not... Make it worse. He never throws stones or shoots the wounded. We have. I have at times. But not Jesus. Because that's what a true human looks like. He won't break you when you're broken. He will pick you up. I can see him taking the reed and wrapping a band-aid around it. Holding it straight until it can heal. Letting it blow again in the breeze. A smoking, I I remember reading this years ago, a smoking candle or a flax, he will not snuff out. He will not um, quench it. He doesn't come up with, you know, spit to something that's just barely hanging on there. Oh, there you go, your light's out. But no, he kindles the fire and blows on it again. Have you ever felt in your life like I'm just smoldering here? I got no flame left. I feel like I'm going out, God, and I'm going out fast. All the wind has been blowing against me. I have a little teeny baby on the inside. There's a little spark somewhere that's allowing some smoke to come up. There's a really cool picture with that, JJ, that. I mean, that actually irritates me when I put candles out. I have one of those little candle snuffers, but... When you try to find it, it's never available. And the candle's still smoldering. You're like, ah, it's stinking. Not to Jesus. He doesn't quench that kind of stuff. I love this verse. I've always loved this verse because it's always given me hope. He will bring forth justice for truth or he will bring forth justice in truth. What does justice look like in God? I used to think justice was, you know what? You deserve life in jail. You know what? You deserve punishment, punishment, punishment. But justice to me is God hanging on a cross for every one of us and saying it's forgiven. I'm not saying we don't obviously have rules and laws, but in our heart, it should break all of our heart, not cause us to go, yeah, you got what you deserved, you lousy human. It should break our heart when people are thrown in jail or have consequences that are heart-wrenching. I watch different things on the web, you know, one young man who has an ad out and he puts behind a mirror at every bar 
this bar, I shouldn't say, not all bars, but some bars, they actually have it where the mirror lights up and shows the video of him in jail talking to the people at the sink that are drunk and telling them his story, how he's in jail for years because he drove drunk and killed someone. And the heart-wrenching, the heart-wrenching story. My heart breaks for him. One moment, one bad decision in your life. And we're punishing him, punishing him. And our jails are crowded. I mean, since 1978, I believe, we had 350,000 men in jail, and now it's in the millions in jail in America. Did you know that America is the highest country in the whole world by way far of incarceration? We, we're the land of the free, and yet we have so many slaves. We're the land of the free. There's opportunity, and yet we throw people in jail. I mean, literally, some of the laws that were signed by President Clinton back in the day, yep. scary laws, like three strikes and you're out. The third strike, you go to jail for long. Marijuana, yep. 30 years. We act, we ask why people are angry. Come on. Some things you need a swat on the leg when you're a toddler. Other times you need a time out. Sometimes you just need a scolding or a talking to. You know, come on, you don't need the belt this long when you just... What are you teaching? What have we done? Not my Jesus. I love this. He will not fail nor be discouraged until he's established justice in the earth. My Jesus is so patient. You guys, he's been so patient with me. I mean, I've had it wrong so long, so many times. <clears throat> and yet Jesus, he kept saying, you know, I know you, Cindy. I'm going to bring you about to a different way. I'm going to help you. I'm going to show you a different way to think because I won't give up on you until I establish justice, real justice. What does it look like on this earth? I'm patient, I'm long-suffering, I'm kind, I'm gentle. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be all of that to you and more. He will not give up on us. He, thank God. He won't give up on us until we look more human. And the coastlands shall wait for his law. Well, what is his law? His law is love. His law is love. People are waiting, you guys, on love. They're just waiting on love. What does it look like? How can we show them? What can we go about doing good? opening a door, talking to your waitress, tipping the person that cleans your room at a hotel, leaving them a note, telling them to have a blessed day, stripping the bed for them, throwing all the sheets in a pile, put all the towels in the bathtub, make it as easy as you can. I, I clear the table for my waitresses when we're eating. I stack all the dishes and I try to clear it for them. And they come and they're like, thank you. Just to make it a little easier. I know it's tough, you know, waiting on people all day long. Just anything we can do that's good. Don't underestimate it. Don't make it, well, that wasn't very, just be human. Yeah. Yeah. He showed us how to treat people, guys. The woman caught in adultery you saw the picture of. No condemnation, no rocks. Just offering her hope from sin, restoring her sense of worth. Sexual sin will rob you of your value. Especially when you give your body to so many and there's no relationship of value to you. You're just a piece of meat to be used. It will destroy your soul. It hurts. I've watched. I've been, I was a youth pastor for years and years. I watched how sexual sin would totally devalue the heart, especially young girls. And how I would work to restore the value. 
The one young girl that she was 12 and her boyfriend was 18 and he was having sex with her over and over again, but he treated her horrible and I noticed how bad he treated her. He treated her like she was a piece of nothing and he owned her and I didn't like it. And they were in our youth group and I'm like, I don't like the way he treats her. And then one day she crawls up on my bed and she tells me, we're having sex. How long have you been doing that, baby? I don't know, quite a while. And he acts like every time we get together that that's, his, that's what I have to give him. That's his portion. And I'm tired of it. I don't know what to do. I don't, feel good, I don't feel good about myself. I'm like, well, I know what we need to do. We need to talk to your mama. I'm not talking to my mom. Well, I'm not talking to your mom. So apparently you have to talk to your mom about it. I'm not. Okay. Well, then we're not going to talk to your mom about it. But you need to. Two months go by, and we have this amazing service. And this young girl comes up to me. She goes, will you come with me? I'm like, yeah, let's go. So we go upstairs. Mom's standing there. I said, um, she has something she wants to tell you. And the little girl starts to just weep. And her mom goes, are you having sex? She's like, yeah. And the mom could not stand the way her boyfriend treated her. And of course, the mom flipped out. <laughs> Sorry, I would love to tell you the story. It was Mom just handled it fine. <laughs> nope, you are never going to see him again. You are breaking up with him. You're 12 years old. He's 18, blah, 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 you know, the whole thing. I could have told him that in the beginning. 12 year olds a little young to be going with 18, you know. Yeah. Nevertheless, she breaks him up. The girl gets so mad at her mom, doesn't talk to her. I'm not kidding for two months. Does not talk to her mother. Her mother comes to me. She goes, she hates me now. She won't talk to me. She literally won't talk to me. She talks to me through the younger kids. What am I going to do? I said, hang in there and love her. You love her. And time goes on, and I, they end up leaving the church because they go to a different church, and they move, and, and I don't see them for years. And years later... I get back in contact. She gets in contact with me, the young girl, and she's in her early 20s and, or close to 20, I think. And she's like, I know who my husband is. I'm like, you do? And the process that God took her on to restore her value and her health and the way she saw herself was so beautiful. I get the story from her. She tells me, you know, Pastor Cindy, after my mom broke me up with this guy, I went to another guy and another guy and another guy and another guy and another guy and, another guy and had sex, 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 sex. It didn't matter because I'd already lost my virginity and I had no worth. It didn't matter. And after a while, I just got to the place I was so low and I felt like I wasn't human. And then she said, I decided one night at an altar, God, you got to help me and I need you to help restore myself, my soul. And the Lord, she told the Lord, I'm not going to do, I'm not dating anybody. I'm not having any relationship with anyone until you tell me who my husband is. Now she's getting older. So the Lord begins to show her this young guy who is a youth pastor and he's in his 20s, like later 20s, and she was, I think, 19 or 20. There was an age gap. He begins to tell her this is the guy. And he's holy, in her eyes, oh my gosh, he's way holier than me. Because if he knew who I really was, he wouldn't want me. But that didn't seem to matter to him. Because he had the heart of Jesus. And he began to approach her and um, ask her to court him and date him or whatever. And they started this relationship. And as time goes on, and they're in this relationship. One night, he like kisses her really passionately, like to the max. And they almost lose it. And she, she's telling me all this. I'm enjoying the story. <laughs> she goes, we almost lost it. And he pulled me away. He looked at me and he goes, I will never do that again to you until I should. He said... If I can't, if I, because that aroused me and I refuse to hurt you, you are the most valuable thing I have. And so 
I will not treat you, even if you don't know what's going on on the inside of me, this way. She said, it blew me away. Blew me away that a man would treat me that way when he could have gone all the way with me. And she said, they dated, I don't know if it was a year, 18 months. After that, he kissed her on the cheek. He would hug her and hold her before he would leave her after a date or when he would spend time with her. And he would only kiss her on the cheek or kiss her forehead or lightly kiss her. But never again with that kind of passion. And over that time, he showed her her value that I love you for you, not for anything sexual that you can give me. I want to know you. And he restored to her the value of being a human woman. It's not about all of this. It's about this. Who are you? The day of their wedding, which I sang in their wedding, before they were taking photos, I wasn't the photographer at the time, and people were taking photos, well, he, they had taken pictures ahead of time. He comes running up to, behind her and scoops her up, puts his arms around the back of her waist, and he gets his face right in her neck, and he's like, ah, oh, you know? and kind of kisses her, but it was kind of a little bit more aggressive, and her eyes got huge. And she looks at me, she goes, he's scaring me. I'm like, he's, she goes, he's scaring me. I'm like, why? She goes, he never acts like this. He's never acted like this. And I'm like, uh-huh, but it's your wedding day. And I walked away, and the Lord goes, did you see what I did for her? I'm like, I saw it, Jesus. You restored her virginity in her soul. You restored her value. You gave her something to look forward to, and you gave her this covenant that's going to be beautiful. I, I swear to you guys, I was up. They had me on the platform the whole time. I was up watching the wedding when she came down the aisle with her dad, this anointing, if that's what you want to call it, presence anointing of Jesus. I, I know if I would have been able to see he was walking down the aisle with her. He restored something to her only he could restore. And he restored it through a beautiful man that loved her worth, that saw her worth. I never forgot it. Never, ever forgot it. She's still my friend. She's on Facebook. She's a beautiful girl. Only Jesus can do that. To teach us how to be human towards one another. That's what he did for her. He said, I don't condemn you. I don't condemn you. Go and sin no more. He gave sight to the blind. We're supposed to restore the blind, guys. They have eyes. They just don't function. We need to restore their sight. Don't knock them down or taunt them. Don't trip a blind person when they're walking by. But sometimes in the spirit or in, in our, with our mouths we do, people that don't see like us, ah, you guys are idiots. They fall on their face. Yes, they don't see. Don't mock somebody that doesn't see like you. Give God time to restore their sight. Give God time to restore their vision. I know it sounds like, maybe this sounds like a Debbie Downer. I'm just really, today, I can just feel this. This is for me, too. Our, our elections are going on, guys. And there's so much venom being spewed everywhere. Let's uncover all the nasty secrets that any, any of our politicians have. I don't care if it's, you know, they stepped on a, uh, you know, a spider four years ago. That was a rare blah, blah, blah. Let's uncover it. Let me show you how horrible they are and bad they are so you don't like them and you won't vote for them. And America, you guys, is so weary right now of it. They're weary. Social media, I, I go to some pages, I'm like, oh, God. The last 25 posts which they put on yesterday are all about how horrible this person is. And you know what? I'm going to be really, really, really honest with you. I have one friend, one that supports Hillary, okay? She'll put a few things on about how bad Donald Trump is. Maybe two, actually. I think I have two that I've seen. These are all Christians. 
that are like destroying Hillary Clinton. How horrible she is. I understand. There are policies I don't agree with. But, and then you see other social media that's like all about how horrible Donald is and all these things he did. And I'm just tired of it all. I can't wait for December. Give me December, God. It's not the way to go. Speak evil of no man. How do we do that? That takes a lot of self-control to be human and not get involved. You know, I, I honestly, Donald Trump, and I, I have to give him kudos for it, he took on the religious right in the sense of he became kind of partners with the religious right, but then when you do something wrong, sometimes the religious will, that's brave. It's just brave. I think I would have just stayed neutral. I don't know what I would have done. I don't want to be in their place. I don't usually talk politics, but I'll tell you what. We need to learn how to look like Jesus. I just don't see Jesus doing that. I don't even remember one sermon Jesus ever preached that was against Caesar. How horrible Rome was. Rome is so bad. Do you know what they're doing right now? You guys need to get mad at Rome. No, in other words, he knew they needed to not get mad at Rome because Rome was going to kick their butt in a few years. He was out to try to get them to be at peace with all men. The gospel of peace, the prince of peace, goodwill to all men, peace on earth, peace. The shoes, the shoes are, that we put on our feet are supposed to be peace, 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 peace. All I want is peace on earth. I used to mock those girls. I'm like, oh, really? Come on, get a line, Miss America. You are irritating. Peace on earth. Everybody wants peace on earth. Well, there needs to be war sometimes. I don't agree with that now. The lame, the blind, it says in Matthew 21, 14, I'm going to end. Matthew 21, 14 says, then the blame, the blind, and the lame, blame is blind and lame together, <laughs> came to him in the temple and he healed them. Luke 14, 13 says, and when you give a feast, invite the poor, the maimed, the lame, and the blind. Wow. Jesus was always going after those that felt inhumane, those that were treated inhumane. This is my Jesus. JJ, put that little boy up. This is my Jesus. He's sitting with the little boy. We know that picture. He's for the refuge, the refugee. He's for the little boy that gets blown out of his house in the middle of the night. He cries over him. That's my Jesus. He gives strength to the weak. Throw another one up there. He's for the hungry. That's what Jesus looks like. He's the hands that reaches out to feed the hungry. Not just, I know it's an African picture, but honestly, guys, that's still a reality going on in this world when there's bazillionaires and there's food everywhere. We throw away more food in America than you can imagine. And there's still little children reaching out saying, can I just have? Why can't we be more human? What is going on? We have to change our message. We have to be more human. I can't feed every one of them, but we can start with one. We can change our world. We can be more humane. We can take one of them, Compassion International. We had a little girl, we pretty much ministered to her until she graduated from high school. It fed her whole family. I was told that $100 will feed one family in Ghana for two months. $100. When I went there and I gave $60 to Ajiman to help with the food because the food was really tough. He hired a chef. He hired a chef who made me anything I wanted. I was like, what? Who does that? With 60 bucks? 
60 bucks goes pretty far in some countries. You think, well, my little $5 doesn't matter. You'd be surprised. Throw the next one. He's for the sex slaves. He's reaching out. Can, what can we do? Pray. Pray. They just uncovered in Detroit this last week a bunch of sex slaves from the age of 12 to 17 trafficking and set those girls free. He's for them. That's my Jesus. That is my Jesus. When they're crying out, help me, because I'm addicted to drugs. That is my Jesus. He doesn't kick them. He's like, let's, let's walk through this together. Right? That's our heart. <clears throat> That's his heart. <clears throat> Excuse me. That's all of our heart. That's what it looks like. That's my Jesus. Is there one more, JJ? Yeah, that right there, that wouldn't be my Jesus. That's not my Jesus. Not my Jesus. When we exclude anyone and make anyone feel and guys, where we're headed with redeeming grace, and I know sometimes you guys, we're going to take the bullets because when you include all, like the Bible actually says, I, don't, I, I always think, what the problem? What the problem? It says it. All, are, all died in Adam, all live in Christ. It says that all have been reconciled to the Father. When? Now, but do all get to experience it? No, because they don't believe. Our job is just to say, hey, you're forgiven. You're loved. Don't bring up their... Jesus didn't bring up the adulterous sin. I love what Pastor Darren preached. He established his relationship with her. You know what? I don't condemn you. This is who I am. I'm not condemning you. No, just go and sin no more. Why? You talked about sin. Basically, he was saying, listen, you go, sin no more, because they will kill you next time. Next time I won't be here to stop them. <laughs> next time, you know, because sin does have consequences. Sin will hurt you. Don't get it wrong. But I don't condemn you. My Jesus is bringing a message to this world of how humans look like and what we are to look like. Our arms are open. Our hearts should be open. And I'm telling you what, when you, when you approach people that way, the walls come down. I'm seeing it work. The walls just come down. You're my brother, you're my sister. It's not us, it's not them. It's not them, it's not us, it's us. It changes everything. That's my Jesus. He gives strength to the weak. He gives courage to the fearful. Jesus said, take courage, it's I, don't be afraid. He was constantly saying, don't be afraid. He gives honor and beauty to the ashes. Guys, the places in your life that are desolate, says in Isaiah 61, 3, to comfort or console those who mourn in Zion, to give beauty for ashes, oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness that they may be called the trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. You know, Jesus goes to the broken places in our lives. He goes to the places where we may feel undone, we may feel like we failed him, we've let him down, we may feel like, who could want me? And I've watched him throughout the years restore. I've watched him make beauty from ashes. And that should be how we act as humans. That's my goal. That's where I'm headed. I'm not there yet. Maybe y'all in this room are a little further than me. But I'm just not there yet. But I'm headed that way. I mean, the Lord was talking to me even this last week about places a couple years ago and things that I said and attitudes that I had. Not to condemn me, but to show me where I've come from. 
You remember, Cindy, when you did this and said that? Oh, that wasn't really human. That was inhumane to say that. That was not nice. At the time, I felt justified. And now it's like, it breaks me. I'm like, God, I, I repent for that. That was not who you are. I repent a lot in my own life if I don't look like Jesus. Like, you know what? That is not who you are. Help me to be who you are. Give me that grace, God, to change. That's our Jesus. That is my Jesus who loves the smoking flask, the broken reed, who loves the, the down and out, who loves the little boy in Syria and cries over war. He weeps over war. Who loves the, the girls that have been trafficking. He's with them while they're being used. He's like, I can restore. He loves those who feel cast out, singled out, separated. All of us can relate. Can anybody not relate to that? Have you ever felt that at times? And in the midst of it all, Jesus is sitting right there going, you got so much value. You are my beloved. You are my treasure. You are beautiful. And every once in a while, he will give us someone to share that with us. Come to the piano, Brett. I want us to stand this morning. And I want us just for a minute, anyone in the room that just needs encouraged, I want to take time to pray over you and have people pray with you. If you just feel like, you know what, I'm one of those ones that I just feel like I'm smoldering here, God, I could use a light. You know? I've felt that way before. Or God, I don't, I, I don't feel very good physically. I just need you to touch me and heal my body. Or I have some needs, God, that I don't know how I can meet these needs. It's impossible for me, but I need you to, I need you to come through for me. And I want us just to pray this morning. Does that relate to anybody? Does anybody in the room want prayer this morning? Um, raise your hand or stand up or come up here, whatever you're comfortable with. If you want to sit in your seat, we'll go to you. If you come up here, we'll pray for you over here. But I just want to take time this morning as the body to be humane. Because Jesus went about doing good and healing. All they were oppressed of the devil. What's oppression look like? It can be sickness, sadness, low self, self-worth. Blind, it can be anything. Blind eyes, not having a revelation of who God is. Does that relate to anybody today? Are we all good? Because I want to take the time to do that if needed. Does anybody want prayer? I need prayer because my throat needs prayer. And right here, it seems really tight. I woke up like that this morning. So I want prayer for healing. And I know you guys got it in you because Jesus is in there. But anybody else need prayer for healing?